Hello and good evening. I'm Rohit Gandhi and you're watching Gravitas. Where we break down the headlines and the day and offer perspective on the issues. On the show tonight, we discuss two phenomena. The first one of misguided youth taking to terrorism. And in the second half, a phenomena called Ompuri, who passed away. The film world remembers Ompuri. But first, the worrying phenomena. There have been many stories about youth from perfectly mainstream families going missing to reportedly surface in the Islamic State. The IS appears to have made steady inroads into parts of South Asia with close to 1,000 men and women reportedly missing from India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. There is a fear that many are fighting in the front lines of Syria and Iraq. Let's take a look at the recruiting ground, predictably from the third world. They were neither poor nor illiterate. On the contrary, many of them were from average middle-class Indian families with engineering and medical degrees to boot. Yet they disappeared in small groups of ones and twos at varying times over the last year or two. Security agencies suspected them of being influenced by the Islamic State propaganda. No one heard about their whereabouts until now, that is. Indian intelligence agencies claim to have stumbled on some leads that might point to the presence of nearly 22 of them in Afghanistan. Some reports indicate that they might have been traced to the eastern Afghan province of Nangarhar. It's not immediately known how many of them might be from the southern Indian state of Kerala. But among those who disappeared, were boys and girls and couples in their 20s and 30s. All belonged to the districts of Kasarkod, Korikod, Kochi and Palakkad. The males were mainly Christians or Muslims, but the females were Hindus who had converted to Islam after marriage. The Emir of the Islamic State responsible for Kerala is said to be Sajir Abdullah Mangalasheri, an engineering graduate. If their disappearance was a cause of concern for India, then the reported relocation of some of these Islamic State cadres from the outfits redoubts in Mosul in Iraq and Raqqa in Syria to closer home in Afghanistan is a bigger worry. Kerala is not the only breeding ground for IS recruits from India. Mumbai, the de facto economic capital of India in the western Indian state of Maharashtra, is equally vulnerable. For instance, five members of a family were among those who left India to join the Islamic State. The family comprised a couple and the infant daughter and the husband's two cousins, one of whom was a medical practitioner. Ramesh Ramachandran, we on. Joining us on this discussion is Vion's senior correspondent, Ramesh Ramachandran. Ramesh, would you say that these disappearances and surfacing in the Islamic State are sporadic instances? Or do you see a bigger story here? Rohit, there definitely seems to be a pattern to what we are seeing uh, happen in our neighborhood. And the motive could be more sinister than one had imagined or anticipated, uh, given the fact that India, which is already vulnerable to uh, terrorism, especially uh, state-sponsored terrorism, would now become even more vulnerable to lone wolf attacks, especially those of the Islamic State kind. Uh, that said, uh, the shift from or the relocation of some of these IS cadres from West Asia, from Syria, from Iraq, uh, and their relocation now to Afghanistan is even more worrying for India because this brings terrorism and the specter of ter terrorism even more closer to India's borders. So uh, India could certainly do well with uh, fewer terrorist groups in its neighborhood than, uh, than what they already are. Rohit. So Ramesh, is there something unique about Kerala that makes uh, the mainstream people more vulnerable? than any other state? 
not really Rohit Kerala uh, is not an exception I mean uh, the IS seems to enjoy uh, uh, in a pan Indian popularity as it were we've seen more cosmopolitan cities across India including uh, Mumbai the which is the de facto economic capital of India fall prey to the IS propaganda uh, for instance as we reported in our uh, story before uh, there are so many instances of families uh, three four five people of a family uh, moving on mass to West Asia to join the Islamic State uh, but that is peculiar in the case of Kerala because Kerala by virtue of being a uh, a state with high literacy rates, a very progressive state in many ways, uh, yet it has fallen prey to uh, more and more people are falling prey to the IS propaganda. So that is a cause for worry, no doubt. Thank you, Ramesh, for that perspective on the story. A very important story which Ramesh will be watching. We are now joined by N.P. Chekkuti, a political activist turned journalist, now executive editor of Tejas, a daily newspaper in Malayalam. He also has worked in Deshe Bimani, Indian Express, and in the past, in many other editions. Sir, how does one explain educated, aware young people falling for ISIS propaganda? Um, you know, I have, a, I have a serious reservations about the kind of, uh, you know, complete, uh, uh, the kind of uh, campaign that is going on all over India, that Kerala is becoming um, uh, the, the center of Islamic uh, terrorism in the whole country. And this is completely wrong. Uh, because, you know, in the case uh, that you have referred to of the, of the 21 youngsters who have disappeared from Kerala, uh, uh, there is absolutely no uh, real uh, hard evidence that they have joined uh, any of the terrorist uh, or uh, militant ranks in either in uh, uh, Iran, Iraq, or uh, Afghanistan, or in I, I think uh, it's simply uh, to be uh, proved. The second uh, thing about uh, this uh, disappearance is that uh, they have been religiously, uh, you know, ex uh, uh, what is called extremely religious people. You know, what's kind of uh, extreme religiosity creates a lot of problems. And these people have actually gone to a place called Dhammaji, where a Salafi uh, uh, religious group has been uh, uh, having their uh, religious center. And of course, the Salafi school of Islam is creating some problems all over the world, and the youngsters are being misled into uh, very wrong uh, notions. But I, I have never seen, I am a Kerala journalist, I have been uh, working in Kerala for a long time. I have never seen any report from the family, because there are families back home in Kerala, uh, which say that uh, any of these people have been actually sure. been uh, uh, got into any, uh, any illegal activities or uh, or, 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 or uh, you know, terrorist activities. Of course, they have Mr. been misled in... Sure. Mr. Chakuti, but do you see uh, it challenging in the long term? Do you think uh, there needs to be a little more careful look at if they are landing up in uh, extremely right-wing uh, organizations, then there needs to be something done in the long term? Mr. Chikuri, if you can hear me, uh, my question to you is, do you think uh, for the long term, one will have to be a bit more careful, the government will have to continue watching what's going on? We've lost Mr. Chikuri, I think we're going to move on from here. In Bangladesh, the story turns starker. Earlier on Friday, the masterminds behind the Dhaka cafe attack were killed by the Dhaka police. That is just part of the story. Authorities are concerned. Over more than 200 young men reported missing by their families. They're suspected to have joined the Islamic State. The mastermind behind the worst terror attack in Bangladesh's history is now dead. Nurul Islam Elias Marjan an accomplice, Saddam Hussein, were killed in a Dhaka suburb by police commandos in an operation early Friday morning. Nurul Islam was identified as a leader of a splinter group of the Jamat ul Mujahideen Bangladesh, or JMB. His wife had been picked up by police back in September. His accomplice, Hussein, was wanted for killing a Japanese national in 2016. Marjan's antecedents are unremarkable. He was a madrasa student with close ties to his teacher 
who in turn was linked to the Ali Hadith Andolan Bangladesh, an extremist group affiliated to the JMB. While the attackers of the Holy Artisan Bakery appear to be accounted for, the authorities are worried that more than 261 men whose families have reported them missing could be linked. The authorities have no idea where they've gone, although the suspicion is that Islamic State and Al-Qaeda may have been their new destinations. Alarming still are reports that the Islamist virus is infecting the wives of radicalized husbands. Recent studies on the growth of radicalism in Bangladesh suggest that both Al-Qaeda and ISIS are fishing there, looking for new recruits, trying to radicalize young men into their way of thinking. Bangladesh has seen a steady rise in Islamist-linked violence, including attacks targeting online critics of Islamists. Bureau Report, Weon. Bangladesh has certainly seen a tremendous amount of challenges. In the last few years, there have been a lot of attacks, and certainly a lot of people have lost their lives. One of the things that Bangladesh has been seeing is a lot of the young people, from some of them from extremely well-off families, uh, joining uh, the ranks. Al-Qaeda in the early 2000s had a tremendous amount of impression in Bangladesh. Uh, the Americans join hands with the Bangladeshis, and then later it is now the ISIS. Now joining me live from Bangladesh is our Bangladesh Bureau Chief, Saad Hamadi. Saad, give me a sense of how does Bangladesh deal with this challenge now? Rohit, the threat that has appeared since uh, last year, particularly with the July attack, is more grave or graver than the previous threats we have seen uh, in course of time. Previously, we've seen militant attacks uh, where uh, individual secular minds were hacked, which had equal threats, but then again, it wasn't a mass scale attack that was carried as, the, as in the case of the July attack. Mm. And the affiliations that have come about uh, in the form of ISIS or Al Qaeda have warned and, and um, sort of instilled a threat of fear among the people in, in terms of the security they're, they're, they have in the country and the trust on the law enforcement as well. However, the, the reaction or the retaliation since the July attack has been a, a coordinated effort from all the security forces in the country sure. to, do, to take sure. down on the militants, which essentially the government maintains a homegrown militant uh, members of Jamaat al Mujahideen in Bangladesh and Ansar al-Islam. Sure. But then again, these two, uh, these two uh, terror outfits that we're talking about have affiliations with the international terrorist outfits such as the Islamic State, uh, which is Jamaat al the new Jamaat al Mujahideen in Bangladesh seeks to have an affiliation with. Uh, in case of uh, the Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, the Ansar al-Islam, uh, members of the Ansar al-Islam are working for it. So there is an international connection, at least in terms of these uh, terrorist outfits that are operating in the country. Saad, so let's take the case of the cafe attacker who was killed uh, earlier today. Just confirms what was always feared in Bangladesh circles. Right. So the, 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 the attack that was carried out in, uh, in, the, in the July cafe uh, we see that uh, Marzan, Nurul Islam Marzan, is said to be one of the key coordinators or among the masterminds to have planned. And the terrorists who carried out the attack have communicated with Marzan. But these are messages that we are getting from the law enforcement agencies. And uh, since then, there have been a number of uh, counter-terrorist raids carried out where law enforcement agencies have found dots or connections linking up to these terrorists carrying out the attack in, July, in, the, in the cafe in July. Marzan's case has been one of the uh, high-ranking profiles among the terrorists uh, who have planned the attack or have uh, provided training and motivation. Now, having said that, there are two concerns being posed by the security analysts. One is that the information that we're getting are essentially from the law enforcement. There isn't another way to verify the, the level of this, uh, the ranks of the level of the threat perception of these individuals that the law enforcement agencies are talking about. The other fact that security analysts point out is that there may be more slipper cells 
uh, in the country which are not explored. The fact that these high-ranking or the leadership that's being talked about in place of uh, JMB or Ansar al-Islam, what they're pointing out is that terrorism is not confined to just the high, high-ranking uh, members of the terrorist outfit. There could be other sleeper cells or networks that uh, this law enforcement agencies need to keep a sure. close watch. Sure. Otherwise, this may go out of hand again. Sure. And they also point out that there is possibly a sense of hibernation, an awkward silence in the country that may break, uh, break out bad unless there is a uh, close watch on this situation. Sure. Uh, Saad, you know, when you look at Bangladesh's uh, physical uh, situation, it's certainly protected. It's got India on one side and then Myanmar on the other. Uh, the other day when we were looking at the United States, we were talking about how it could prevent an attack after 9-11. And we realized that because it was so secluded, they could actually weed out a lot of the elements. Bangladesh is pretty much in that position. If it wanted to, and if it was tough on it, it could weed out all of these outside influences. Do you think going after the sleeper cells uh, is an extremely important task that the Bangladesh intelligence and the administration needs to do? It is of high importance for Bangladesh to actually uh, dig out these uh, sleeper cells if there are any, as it is pointed out by the security analysts. But look, having said that, there is also a political connotation behind uh, these uh, extremist elements that we're talking about. The fact that uh, there is an Islamist party we have uh, in Bangladesh that we see, uh, Jamaat Islami, which the government, the ruling party, always points out has an affiliation or some level of involvement uh, in, in this terrorist outfit. Uh, is also something to be looked at very closely. But then also we have seen these uh, terrorist links in, uh, during, during, during the other times as well. Now, the connection that, that we see uh, is quite global. Although the issues might be uh, very local, but it, the influence is coming across from all the way to Syria to, uh, to even in India. There, are, there is a connection. There have been affiliates or members who have been hiding in India uh, from Bangladesh and vice versa. Sure. Saad, thank you very much for that perspective. We now move on to Pakistan. Another country where the ISIS is spreading its tentacles and, if anything, so freely. Even though the Pakistani authorities deny any footprints of the ISIS in the country, until sources in Pakistan claim that dozens of families have migrated to live under the so-called Islamic State in the Middle East. More on this by our bureau chief, Taha Siddiqui. At first, there were only reports of militants leaving to join Islamic State group when they were driven out by military operations in the tribal belt. But now recently reports have emerged that population from mainstream Pakistan have also left the country to join their ranks. Security sources claim that dozens of families from Punjab province have gone missing, with relatives contacting the police to ascertain their whereabouts following which investigations by the authorities have revealed that such families have migrated to regions in Syria and Iraq under the Islamic State group control. Given that Pakistan has major fault lines on sectarian grounds and a large radicalized youth population, experts believe that the country is a fertile ground for ISIS recruitment. While Pakistani government denies any presence of IS group in Pakistan, two of the recent suicide bombings in the country were claimed by the group, forcing authorities to crack down on Sunni extremist groups, who are believed to be acting as a conduit between the militants in Middle East and Pakistan. Observers also feel that since IS group is being pushed back in its home ground, Pakistan may see a return of these splinters back home with a dubious baggage. And if such a trend continues, the country may witness a new wave of violence and extremism. In Islamabad, this is Taha Siddiqui for Vion. Moving on to the story of how these Islamic groups certainly are constantly challenging administrations in South Asia. But what we have to look at is their spread across the world, not just in South Asia, but globally, when, whether it's in the UK, 
or anywhere else. It's possible to address these issues. In Britain, every week, over 60 children under the age of 18 are at risk of extremism, now being referred to a counter-terrorism program. Some British Muslim leaders have condemned the program as a spying operation, but police insist anti-extremism course is a fundamental requirement to fight homegrown terror. Our London Bureau Chief, Mandy Clark, reports. Keeping the streets of Britain safe is the goal of the anti-terrorism program PREVENT. Around 8,000 people have been referred to the program over the past four years, and an alarming 8% of those were under 10 years old. Police say the scheme has played a major role in stopping more than 150 attempted journeys to conflicts in Iraq and Syria. The government claims the program de-radicalizes those at risk of extremism and deters them from committing acts of terrorism. It also provides help and support with jobs, educational opportunity and housing. Though police recognize that some communities were very suspicious of PREVENT, it called the criticism of the program hysterical. The majority of the cases referred to the program are related to Islamic extremism. But Muslim groups have called for a review of the strategy, saying their community has been unfairly targeted, with too many referrals unsubstantiated, and even teachers obliged to report suspicious extremist behavior. However, a recent internal government review of PREVENT recommended it should be strengthened, not undermined, and put forward 12 suggestions on how to reinforce it. Mandy Clark, we on London. We are joined live by our London Bureau Chief, Mandy Clark. Mandy, your story certainly sounds encouraging, but the worry is children as young as 10 are having to attend these programs. What is your understanding? Well, the, the principle here is um, faith schools, and particularly Islamic schools. Britain in the past had um, a an issue with them because they didn't have their eyes on the curriculum and they found that um, at least six schools were at risk of radicalizing their pupils and some were closed down and now those other ones have been extremely monitored but children start going to school around four so by age nine you there is a high chance they will be at risk of um, being radicalized you know, just a few years ago, I was in a de-radicalization center in uh, Swath in Pakistan. And there were, then there were stories also coming out about de-radicalization centers in Saudi Arabia. A lot of uh, what they call the bad uh, terrorists which attack their own countries, uh, countries will work, you know, tr trying to reduce those. But at the same time, uh, you know, groups have been talking about how people are being trained to fight terror from the inside, and a lot of them really are intelligence agents. Do you think it's creating an atmosphere of mistrust within the Muslim community itself? I think there's no doubt that the Muslim community feels that they're being unfairly treated, that they're being targeted. Uh, they pointed out um, that it's not just uh, radical Muslim extremism. There's other forms of terrorism, including uh, far-right extremism. But they seem to, the, the Muslim community in Britain uh, seems to be under the microscope. And every time there's talk of terrorism, it, it always seems to be um, radical Islam. So they feel unduly um, scrutinized and that there have been too many cases where Muslims have been referred to these programs and they weren't uh, a real threat. So they feel like it's a way the government can spy on the community. Now, I was seeing a, a sh program which was coming out of the BBC. This was uh, a little uh, a video of uh, women talking about going and being brides in ISIS territories and being married six times and seven times. And there has been a lot of criticism of that today. Do you think uh, there is too much targeting of the Muslims in the UK? It's, you know, yes, in a way they have been under uh, scrutiny, but if these programs manage to turn away at least a few people who are even contemplating going to conflict zones, it's hard to see 
it, that they're doing more damage than good. There was one example that the police gave, and now we can't independently verify it, but they said they had one boy from the Midlands who was planning to go to Syria. Three of his friends were already there. Uh, they, he went through this program. He was de-radicalized. He stayed in Britain, and his three friends were killed in combat. So it's those examples. It's saving that one life that you could argue that it, it, it's, that is the more important objective. You know, earlier uh, the argument was that uh, it's because of poverty people are taking to uh, fundamentalism, people are taking to terrorism. But we've seen over the years, whether, whether we looked at Osama bin Laden or we looked at uh, Omar Sharif, who uh, uh, literally killed uh, Daniel Pearl in cold blood, we're seeing more and more educated people take to terrorism. So certainly this is beyond poverty. Thank you, Mandy, for that perspective. There is always such a hope. Um, in trying to change all of that and live in a more peaceful world. Stay with us on the other side of the break. We're going to talk about another phenomenon called Ompuri. He's Bollywood's international film star. He passed away today this morning. A tribute from beyond and Bollywood. That is after the break. Stay with us on Gravitas.